Hi, welcome to the introduction to mineralogy. This is the same basic lecture that you would get the first day of class if we were meeting face to face. Short overview, go over some background material, kind of let you know where things are going to be going this semester. That's a fantastic photo, isn't it? That's Mexico's cave of the giant crystals in Chihuahua. Um, it's in a mining district and when they were drilling uh, for lead zinc, uh, they came upon this big cavern in uh, the year 2000. Though some of those crystals are 40 feet long, and uh, you can see a guy over here uh, standing and looking. Uh, this thing's actually full of water most of the time, hot water too, over 50 degrees C. But anyway, it's a limestone cavern. Uh, it's built in limestone anyway, but then hot water's got in there and uh, sulfate rich and have precipitated these giant gypsum crystals. Pretty cool. Okay, well, the learning objectives for this module are going to be, we're going to briefly discuss the importance of minerals to geology and, of course, society. I mean, this is the reason you're taking mineralogy, and mineralogy is a required class at any university that offers a, a geology major, because minerals are fundamental to the uh, birth, growth, development of the planet, rocks, I mean, you know, humans use them, I mean, it's, it's everywhere. So, uh, very applicable material. We're going to list and describe the definition of material, right, uh, a definition of a mineral. We're going we're gonna to talk about what it means to be a mineral. Briefly describe the course organization so you guys can see why I'm teaching you what I'm teaching you, my rationale. Uh, explain how minerals are named briefly. And, uh, and then explain, finally, how the mineral, main mineral groups are classified. How are we going to break these things up? You ready? Okay. So, why study mineralogy? Well, the simplest reason is that minerals are the building blocks of rocks, right? They're, rocks are just collections of minerals for the most part. And so, if we understand how minerals form then we can understand how the planet forms. And so in this series of diagrams, I've got the entire planet Earth here, and you can see that there's the oceans and there's the continents. And if we zoom in on the continent, you'll see that we get these big outcrops. And of course, they're, they're made of different kinds of rocks, but if we zoom in on the outcrop, in this case, we zoom in and we notice that it's made of granite, right? It's the rock granite. Well, the rock granite, of course, is an igneous rock. So these minerals crystallized out of a magma, but when we look at the individual minerals, that what's causing the color in this rock, we see that we've got a collection mostly of quartz, uh, hornblende, also there's going to be biotite in there, and then the mineral feldspar. We can have one or both, right? There, there's two kinds of feldspars. There's plagioclase feldspars, and there's alkali feldspars, potassium feldspars, what we like to call K-spar. Anyway, so if you want to understand how the planet formed, you got to know where these minerals came from. So one of the first lectures after this intro will be to talk about chemistry, because if we're going to talk about where minerals come from, they are chemical compounds. And of course, we have to understand why they want to form in the first place. So that's enough for us, right? I mean, we understand that, that, that rocks are the, you know, minerals are the building blocks of rocks. And if we want to understand, I'm a petrologist, right? I'm an igneous petrologist, which means I deal with the formation of igneous rocks, both volcanic and plutonic. But when you're talking to your mom or your cousin or your neighbor or whoever, right, minerals are important to everybody. And, you know, they are a huge economic value to civilization. And it, that, that's pretty well shown by this bumper sticker down here um, that says, if it can't be grown, it must be mined. And whether you're a fan of mining or, or not, uh, it doesn't really matter because we need to source these raw materials from somewhere. And understanding the kinds of products that civilization uses uh, will lead you to worldwide mining. 
So when we look over here at some household items, right, we've got a thing of Tums here, which of course helps after a, a, a hardcore uh, Indian meal or whatever might have upset your stomach. And, 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 and Tums are really just calcium carbonate. They're just limestone, the mineral calcite. Ground up, a little bit of sugar in there, right, some kind of binder. But for the most part, it's just calcium carbonate. And um, you, uh, you take this to counteract, right, acid. Just like when you put acid on to, to identify calcite or limestone, right? It reacts, and um, this is all this these tums are doing when you put them in you. So somebody is just mining limestone, grinding them up, and turning them into tums. Of course, here's a salt shaker, and of course, salt is coming from you know halite, right? And uh, a huge commodity. Um, boy, if you want a really good book, read the book Salt. That's its name, and it'll tell you all about through history and, and how the world was basically run uh, uh, on salt. We're getting it, transporting it, right, that kind of thing. Huge, huge, big deal in the, the development of the human race was the, uh, uh, um, the use of salt for pres preservation, not, not only to make, you know, awful stuff taste better. Uh, but look, even look at the container the salt is in, right? This chromed metal cap and the glass container, all stuff that had to be mined. We get over here to the pencil, of course, the lead, quote unquote, is not lead, thankfully. It is graphite, and uh, graphite is carbon, one form of carbon. So again, if you're going to make a pencil, you've got to have some graphite. And up here, you see the little metal band that's probably steel uh, of some type. That has to be mined as well. And then a classic flip phone, um, but if we look at what's inside a phone, a cell phone, um, you can see that there's all sorts of different materials in here, right? Silica, copper, silver, lithium, iron, and then, of course, some petroleum stuff, too. So you're going to make a cell phone. You've got to dig a hole in the ground and pull stuff out. So I think for many people on the planet, if you don't care about how the planet works or the rocks, right, you do care that you get your materials, and if, and if you can't grow it like a tree or cotton or hemp or whatever else you want to grow, right, you got to mine it. So this is very applicable, even though we won't be talking about the economic type minerals, really, um, but, but you should at least uh, think about this. Um, industry, health, and hobbies. Well, let's start with hobbies. So over here, somebody's got a swanky uh, 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 entryway to their home, and here's a giant amethyst quartz, uh, a sort of geode that it, these come out of Brazil, and I don't know what's causing them. They're they're big cavities in volcanic rock with these hot gases and fluids that pass through them, and uh, uh, they played out these large amethyst uh, geode-like structures. Anyway, people are buying these. Lots and lots of minerals get purchased just for decorations. People think they're cool. All right, so you have a mineral collection. They're hobbies. Um, industry, okay, so what this is, this is a zoom in. This is zoomed in on a volcanic rock, and this was a vesicle, right, a hole like in a volcanic rock, like basalt. And it's now filled with a secondary mineral. This mineral didn't grow in the magma, all right? It grew, the magma was erupted, it crystallized, it solidified, it crystallized, right? And, and there was a hole in there, a gas bubble. So it's a vesicle, like the holes you wouldn't see in bread from the yeast and the, and the gases expanding. Okay, then once this rock is buried and it's subject to groundwater passing through it and fluids, right? This mineral, which is a zeolite, right? Zeolite. And uh, this zeolite mineral, when it's crushed up, it just looks sort of like kitty litter. And in fact, kitty litter, here's a kitty down here, uh, probably a little too much uh, kitty litter in that box. But uh, one type of kitty litter, not all kitty litter is made of zeolites, but one type is. Um, there's others that are made out of clays and things. But anyway, so cat litter is a, a zeolite product. Um, and what is so special about zeolites? Well, the mineral, it's a, it's, it's, it's actually classified as a metamorphic mineral because it takes a little heat, um, not so much pressure, but heat uh, to make them. Um, and you find them beyond the, the, the realm of diagenesis and sedimentary rocks. So it's not just like a weathering product. Um, 
But anyway, if you zoom in, and this is the picture here, this big amoeba looking thing, that's a, a, an, a, an enlargement of a zeolite structure. And the thing that zeolites have going for them is when they crystallize, they have these very large holes that are left in the crystal structure. They're big pores. So what you have to think about is the zeolite is like a giant sponge or, or better, a filter. So when you pass fluids, they easily pass through these crushed up zeolites. And what happens is elements that you don't want to have in the water get stuck in the zeolites and the fluids pass on through. So over here, I've got a picture for you of a typical water softener. And a water softener contains two tanks, typically. Uh, uh, the one tank is just full of zeolites. So inside this tank, and this is, this is, these tanks can be three, four feet high. They can be two feet high. It depends upon how big of operation you want. But anyway, you take your household water supply and you push them through these zeolites. You just filter them through the zeolites. And again, they're about crushed up like what's over here in this hand. And as that hard water, the water that contains calcium and, and magnesium right from the ground passes through, those calcium ions and the magnesium ions get stuck in the zeolites. And what ends up going into your house then gets, gets pushed through here and then up this central pipe is softened water. Well, eventually you have to clean out the zeolites and this second tank is full of salt. And what it does is it makes a brine when it's mixed with water and then flushing these zeolites with brine removes the ions that are trapped in them and then it basically flushes and makes the zeolites good again. So at my house, my hard, uh, soft water uh, um, operation replenishes itself, refreshes itself, cleans itself about once a week. All right? So zeolites which are an industrial mineral, easy to mine, they're soft, right? You use them for mostly for industrial water filtration and things like that. They also work in kitty litter because when the cat whizzes in the kitty litter, the, 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 the pee is full of a big ammonia molecules and those ammonia molecules get stuck in the zeolites and of course that, that helps to take care of the smell. Neat, huh? Okay, well when I was looking around for stuff to show you and make this meaningful, I also came upon this company that sells this natural zeolite powder. And I was really uh, intrigued, so I zoomed in and looked, and it says it's nature's best detox for radiation, heavy metals, viruses, and cancer relief. And so if radiation has kryptonite, it's called zeolites. And you know, that's not complete nonsense because when you take the large atoms, the large uh, radioactive atoms like uranium and those sorts of things, they'll also get stuck, sorped they call it, sorption into zeolites. And so they, they, they sometimes line these radioactive areas with a zeolite material just in case anything leaks, it'll be sorped up by the zeolites. So I didn't know that this would work in your human body, but they tell you so. They say, hey, you can detox heavy metals, you can smother viruses. It shrinks cancerous tumors. Mm. Makes your body highly alkaline, so disease doesn't want to be in there. Restores lost energy. Hey, you guys better get some of this zeolite powder and take it before mineralogy, man. So, restores lost energy, and you feel that mental fog lifting, right? And you feel vibrant and energized. Wow. And I thought it just helped with cat whiz. So anyway, there you go. Okay, enough of that. Now, let's look at the definition of a mineral. Mineral is naturally occurring, inorganic, homogeneous solid with a definite chemical composition and an ordered atomic arrangement, which means it's crystalline. All right, so let's take a look. Naturally occurring and inorganic. Okay, well, here we go. Here's a lava flow in Hawaii leaking out, right? And now it's cooling. And of course, when it cools, the the atoms get together and form crystals and so we see minerals crystallizing from magmas. We also see uh, minerals crystallizing from water or fluids when they evaporate, right? So, so like this guy says over here, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the precipitate. So 
Minerals can be precipitated out of the water. They can crystallize out of magmas, of course, and also we can see minerals precipitating or being crystallized by organisms. And we, this, this doesn't violate the inorganic aspect of that, right? Because, you know, when a shell, uh, an animal dies and its shell's left over, they pile up to become rocks. So, okay, so in some places you have a lot of sponges and corals and that kind of thing. So anyway, there you go. Now, the naturally occurring part, there's many minerals um, that we can produce in the laboratory, right? And these are synthetic. So, so they're still like these. This is how you make a diamond, okay? This is a, uh, a, a large diamond press, and there's four different uh, sort of rams that push in here, like four different um, um, uh, presses that come in all in this central point down here. And for scale, you can see a guy's noggin right here. Anyway, you put a lump of coal or a carbon little uh, uh, blob down there, and when you squeeze the, the, the heck out of this thing, up to mantle-like pressures and temperatures, you have to add temperature too, you can make a diamond out of, you know, carbon. And so over here, it's probably a little too small for you to see, but here's a little family, right? And these two things that look like uh, dog turds are uh, lumps of coal and there's mama and the and the and the and the daughter or son i can't tell what it is but anyway it says and they're remarking about their father who's got the hat on here and he says well uh your dad's been under a lot of pressure lately telling you that of course when you take carbon in the form of coal and you squeeze and heat it to mantle like temperatures and pressures uh you can turn it into something new like metamorphism right and we can get a diamond I was also researching this sort of thing and came across this company called Life Gem, and where you can take your ashes, uh, your cat, your dog, whatever, and turn it into a diamond. Pretty cool. So um, anyway, most of the diamonds that are made synthetically are used in industry. Drill bits for cutting through rocks, uh, 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 tile saws, you know, you name it, right? Okay, so nothing synthetic, um, but uh, of course we can make materials um, in the laboratory. But okay, now a homogeneous solid. So 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 of course minerals are solid, right? They're not liquids. They're not gases. Um, they have cooled to the point where they are in a solid state. And what's meant by a, a, a homogeneous is is that for more or less the elements are, are distributed evenly, right? Certainly they have their places in these crystal lattices, but you don't find uh, one element on one side of a mineral and different elements on the other side. It's more or less, it's homogeneous and it's a solid, okay? Now it has to have a, a chemical composition, and I say definite, but, but some minerals can actually have can vary their chemical composition just a little bit here and there. Um, and you can also contaminate a mineral with other elements, and, and, and that's okay too, and we'll talk about that. But, but for the most part, here's a good example. Here's a model of halite, right? There's, there's, a, there's a chunk of halite. You guys have all seen halite, and if you put your tongue on that, it would taste nice and salty. Um, anyway, halite is made out of sodium, and chlorine, right, one to one. So the formula is NaCl, and and you can't put more Na or you can't put more Cl. I mean, it is what it is, right? So in order to be this mineral, you have to have that chemical composition, and you have to have this arrangement of them, right? If you change the arrangement, then you get a different mineral. If you change the composition, of course, you get a different mineral. And a good example of that is with graphite and diamond, right? They're both made out of carbon, but both of them have very different crystal structures, right? So anyway, um, yeah, so we're going to have a definite chemical composition, and I mentioned to you that, that every once in a while we can pop one of these out, like say we take a, a sodium out of here and we replace it with a potassium. That's okay. We call that substitution, and many, many minerals do it because you know, these minerals aren't grown in purified areas. I mean, some, a lot of minerals are pretty pure, 
but many minerals have other substitutions in there and of course those cause some neat effects a lot of times the neat color in minerals is caused by the addition of some small amount of an impurity again and there's different ways that we can substitute we'll get to that around lecture three or so all right so that's the definition of a mineral now let's take a look at how the course is broken down the first three weeks okay so the first three weeks of the class which is about 20 percent of the total class we're going to be using the big green book, we call it, right? This book has been around forever. If you notice, it's the 23rd edition. So, you know, I don't know. I think I took, took this class when we were probably in the 18th edition or something. Anyway, it hasn't changed much. Um, they've added a lot more material over the years. It's gotten better. It's very expensive, but you can buy it used. And, you know, I've never sold mine because, you know, the the... The Manual of Mineral Science is not a textbook like you read it like a novel. It's more of a, uh, um, it, 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 it's got data, facts. You look up minerals, you find out the details of different minerals. So it's a, it, it, it's sort of a glossary and a manual and, and, and everything all rolled into one. So here we are. You are, we are in the introduction right now. And of course, the second lecture for this week will be the Mineral Chemistry Lecture. I tell you over here, K means this Klein book, right, the green one, and it's going to be chapters 1, 3, and 4. So the first three weeks, we're going to cover things like mineral chemistry up to crystallography. You're going to have a couple of problem sets. You'll have a quiz, right? The quizzes are going to be taken online, um, and, and they're just really practice. I just want to keep you up with us. I want to make sure that you haven't gotten too far behind. And so what's going to happen every couple of weeks is I'll give you a quiz, you're going to download it, you're going to fill it out, you're going to upload it back into Blackboard, right? If those of you that have taken a class from me online, similar, okay? That's going to make sure you can see the kinds of questions I would be asking you. And these will really help you when it comes time for studying for the exams. Okay, what's next after the first three weeks? Okay, then starting week four and leading up to week nine, we're going to be talking about optical mineralogy. This is something that's brand new for everybody. Five weeks, the next 33% of the class. Okay, And what happens during this part is I teach you how to use the petrographic microscope. It's a polarizing microscope. It's really cool, and it's going to allow you to dig way deeper into rocks than you can with a hand lens and just using your eye. Okay. It's, it's a little tricky, but I've gotten, I've gotten hundreds and hundreds of people through this before, and you will too, okay? I promise you, you stick with me, you're going to learn something cool about minerals that you never knew, and it's going to open up a whole new world for you, especially in petrology. This is why I spend a third of the class covering optical mineralogy is, if you're going to go on to be a petrologist, igneous, metamorphic, sedimentary, you have to know how to use the scope because all the big details are down in there at the microscopic level. So five weeks for this, and of course your first lecture exam will come at week five. So I'm not giving you anything else to do during those lecture exams. Those lecture exams will be proctored over in the e-learning center. Each one of you will make a reservation and go over there at the time you want during that week right, that works for you, and you'll take this exam, okay? Then the third and final part of the class is the final four weeks, okay, and that is what we call systematic mineralogy. This is where you take your knowledge that I've taught you in the introduction and background. You know something about crystallography and mineral chemistry. You also know about optical mineralogy, and then what we do is we look at the major mineral groups that make up most rocks, and these are all silicates, okay? And you're going to be going over, you know, both in hand specimen and in the microscope, what's going on with those mineral groups. And again, this is back to both the, uh, the, uh, the, the K book um, and the N book, which is the Nessie Optical Mineralogy book. So three, five, and four, that totals up to 12. Where's the missing three weeks? Hey, those are those three midterm exams I was talking about. And again, 
These are going to be proctored through the eLearning Center at UAA. If you look in the syllabus, I've got a link in there, and what will happen is this: as this exam time gets close, you'll need to make a reservation with them for a day and time, and you'll go in and they'll proctor and they'll give you the exam. Okay? All right. So moving on, let's talk quickly about what it takes to name a mineral. Man, minerals have a wild, wild names. And, and, and I don't know if you've ever known or heard or why, but anyway, you can use just about anything to name a mineral. And it's, it's usually given by the person who first identified the mineral. Anyway, you see minerals named for their physical properties. Okay, so olivine, this is a common mineral, right? Olivine, and this is olivine down here. It's named for the color, olive, right? Olive, like olive green. Um, the mineral magnetite, and here's some um, crystalline magnetite. It forms these little tetrahedra. Um, and magnetite, of course, is given the name because it's, you guessed it, magnetic. Um, some minerals, here's chromite, and, and chromite is named after a chemical aspect of the mineral. Of course, chromite contains the, the, a lot of the element chromium, and so it's named after that. Many, many, many minerals are named after where they are found. So Franklinite is from Franklin, New Jersey. Labradorite is from Labrador. And, and, and again, you'll see a lot, a lot of minerals named after locations where they were found. Uh, public figures, these don't have to be scientists, but, but many of them are. Here's Smithsonite. Oh, there's, 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 there's Labradorite, right? Sorry, I meant, didn't mention that. That beautiful iridescent Labrador. Um, and, and, of course, this is the shiny, uh, this is a, a Labradorite. It's a type of feldspar, a type of plagioclase feldspar. Anyway, Smithsonite is named after this guy Smithson, who was a philanthropist from the late 1700s. And there's Smithsonite, um, this blobby sort of looking green stuff. And then finally, the last example I give to you is a very common metamorphic mineral called silimonite, or you can call it silimanite, but it's silimonite. And uh, silimon was a noted mineralogist. And so here it is in quartz, and what happens is the silimonite is these long rod-like fibers, and it creates this sort of cat eye effect when you polish it up. Okay, so there you go. There's the ways you can name minerals. How about classifying them? any large collection, and there's over 4,000 minerals identified on Earth, and so as soon as you start to um, acquire more than just a few of something, you're going to want to figure out how to classify them into different organized groups. And I've given you two examples here. Here's somebody's butterfly collection. So, how do you put the butterflies? Well, I don't know, but it looks like he did it by color here. We've got some blue ones, we've got some uh, orangey ones, we've got some light colored ones, I don't know. Anyway, you can do them by color, and you could certainly do minerals by color if you wanted to. Now, that's not going to tell you very much. Over here, here's a guy's giant car collection, right? And, and, and it, this thing is so big, he's got different rooms for different... Uh, 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 places where they've come from. This is the English cars. You'll see some Jaguars in here, right? So these are the English uh, cars in this guy's collection. So the point is, is you have to come up with some aspect of, your, of, of what you are collecting to allow you to classify it. And with minerals, there's a couple of ways. Um, hey, that's Lila, and she likes minerals, apparently. Anyway, there's crystallography, all right, and crystallography would, would be you would use their crystal shape to, to classify them. And, and that means the ones that look like little squares or pyramids or they're long and slender, right? These, this is the way if you go to like the Smithsonian, uh, the museum, and you see a, collections of minerals, they'll typically be displayed by their shapes, right? hexagonal ones and everything else, which is really cool, no problem. But with geology, right, we really want to group the minerals together that kind of form together. So, so, so instead of using their shape, right, what we want to use, okay, is their chemistry. And, and, and you know, in chemistry, right, so, so, so in rocks, the minerals that typically grow together 
um, and, and so our, the shape doesn't help us. And so, you know, we rarely see quartz in its hexagonal form. We rarely see the feldspars with their sort of box-like form. We see them all mashed together in here, right, into one big conglomerate. So, so using their shapes is not going to really help us. But what really helps us is their chemistry because minerals that are found together tend to have similar chemical properties. So whether you're an evaporite or whether you formed in a basaltic magma, right, you have things in common. So chemistry is going to be the way to go for classifying minerals for geologists. And when it comes to breaking down minerals into their major groups, right, classifying into their major groups, we're going to see silicate minerals versus non-silicate. That's the big divisions, right? Shove silicate to one side, non-silicate to the other. And silicate minerals turn out to be the most common type of minerals on Earth. Um, um, they are all, every silicate mineral has SiO4, right, which is the, silica tet the formula for the silica tetrahedra um, as its building block. So you have a silica tetrahedra, uh, uh, bonded to various cations to produce all the different minerals. And of course the silica tetrahedra link up into different shapes, but then you add cations to it. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in the next lecture and then the next lecture after that. But every silicate mineral has SiO4. That's the chemical. That's what they all silicate minerals have in common is they have this complex anion SiO4 right as their building block and why is that the case why you know silicate minerals are the most common group of minerals on the planet and again never forget this the reason that they're the most common is because silicon and oxygen are the two most common elements in the crust so you dig up the crust you look at its composition and you'll find that about 75 percent of the Earth's crust is just silicon and oxygen. Oxygen being about 50% of that, silicon being about the next 25. So it makes sense, right? If we're gonna make minerals on Earth, they're, they're most likely gonna be made out of silicon and oxygen because that's the two most common elements. All right, and when we look at all minerals, about greater than 90% of Earth's crust is made of silicate minerals. So guess what? What do you think we're going to focus on in this class, right? We can't talk about every mineral, but you know, if you understand how the silicate minerals work, you're good to go for most of Earth's crust. So when you take a look at this big pie chart, what we see is this big golden color here is plagioclase, right? Then alkali feldspar, right? So just the two feldspars together make up over 50% of the Earth's crust. And then you add quartz in, now you're getting even more, right? So just this section right there is just quartz and feldspar. Okay, then we come over here, we've got the pyroxenes, then we've got amphiboles, right? Micas, clays, and then the rest of the silicates. Well, look, that's almost the whole Earth, right? This last little pie slice here, right, is non silicates. That's everything else. So, again, if you ever wonder why I'm focusing on the silicate minerals, it's because that's the best bang for the buck here. Non-silicates, if you're not a silicate, what are you? Well, you could be a carbonate. That's the most common non-silicate mineral, right? Carbonates, instead of having SiO4, they have CO3. So if you don't, if you're in a place like Florida and there's no silicates around, you're going to be dominated by carbonates. The halides right? That's like halite, salt, where you're bonded to chlorine, fluorine, or bromine. You can have the oxides, where you're bonded to oxygen, sulfides, where you're bonded to sulfur, sulfates, like those big gypsum crystals in that cave of the giants in Mexico I showed you, that's SO4, or you can have the native elements. You're not bonded to anything. You're just that element, right? Metals bonding to other metals. All right, so silicates are what we're going to focus on. Now, silicates get further subdivided based on their internal order. So this is how we divide the silicates into subclasses. So what happens is 
The SIL-4 tetrahedra polymerize, meaning they make these long chains. They make these structures that look like, uh, like the space uh, station or something, right? These big, frilly, uh, 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 complex structures, all made out of the silica tetrahedras. And so the six main groups of silicates are the nesosilicates. Neso means island. Sorosilicates or disilicates, these, this, the soro means heap, cyclo, that's like circle or ring, uh, ino, which means thread, and these can be single or double, phylo means leaf, these are the sheet silicates like muscovite and biotite, or finally the tecto, and tecto means the builder, so these are these, the most elaborate silicates, and these are also called framework silicates, so things like quartz and feldspar. We're going to be going over these much more, putting things into these different categories, and you'll be wondering, well, why does quartz make a tectosilicate, and why does something like olivine make a nesosilicate? Over here, this ratio, that's the silica to oxygen ratio in these various groups. So we can see that in nesosilicates, we have one silicon atom for every four oxygens. But then as we combine these tetrahedra into these polymers, right, these longer chains and things, we reduce the silica to oxygen ratio. So here's a uh, panel taken from an intro lab book, right, physical geology lab book, showing you these various different structures, right? So here are the uh, nesosilicates. Here's the inosilicates, right? Here's the, di, uh, the, the double chain inosilicates, right? And here's sheet silicates. And then here's those framework or tectosilicates. So you can see that it's these tetrahedra linking up into these large polymers. And then the silicate minerals are going to be divided into one of these six classes. All right, well, that's it. All right, so next time, the next lecture, we're going to discuss, we're going to go into mineral chemistry and remind you of things that you once knew, uh, like why do these elements want to get together in the first place? What's going to cause bonding? You know, that sort of thing. And ultimately, we'll actually get into deeper into why do certain minerals form certain ways and other minerals form different ways. It's going to be a repeat of the general chemistry that you've forgotten, and it really nicely overlaps with those of you that are in geochem this semester because you'll be hearing, you know, it coming from both sides. Cool? Okay, there's your little silica tetrahedra, right? This is with the atoms, the atoms expanded, so there's a four oxygens and your one silicon atom, right? And, uh, 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 and there they all, all, all smash down, right, making a tight fit. And what's that little plus four there, and what's the little two minus? Well, if you don't remember that, stay tuned to the next lecture. All right, see ya.